Well, on Friday, Facebook suggested that I add someone as a contact because we had friends in common. Her name's Shelly Rambo, and I saw it, I thought, wow, I have not talked to Shelly in almost 30 years. Uh, she was the daughter of the president of the Christian Missionary Alliance. Uh, she was in seminary with me my last year, and she was dating one of my close friends. So in Hebrew class, I'll never forget Shelly leaning over to me and saying, you should ask Deb out. I said, you know, I, I, I've thought about it. And she said, you should do it. Now, when the daughter of the president of the alliance tells you to do something, I mean, clearly that's from the Lord. So right after class, I went and uh, asked Deb out uh, on our first date. And it's, the rest, as they say, is tragedy. I mean, I mean, history. It's history. I, I always get that confused. Well, actually, yesterday was our 28th anniversary. And... Uh, I know you're clapping that Deb has hung in there that long. Yes, she deserves a medal, a prize, a ribbon, something. Well, of course, hey, all right, Bill, I heard that. Bill, no, what you're supposed to go is, no, Mark, you're wonderful. No, you're really, not really, but Deb. Well, according to the information I found online about Shelley Rambo, when I looked up her to see what she's doing now, I found out she's a professor of theology at Boston University. In an article about her in Faith Leadership Magazine, it states this, Theologians have always wrestled with questions about suffering. Why do we suffer? Where is God in the suffering? Does God will suffering? But new research into trauma pushes this to the extreme, said theologian Shelley Rambo, who wrote a book called Resurrecting Wounds. The article says that she became interested in the field of trauma while at Yale University back in the 90s, and uh, researchers were studying the effects of the Holocaust on survivors. And so she continued to explore the theological consequences and issues of suffering and witness, especially with military chaplains and others who've experienced trauma. Well, in the art article, she argued that Christians often ignore the problems of pain and trauma simply by pointing to the resurrection. In other words, in heaven, the pain will stop. But she points out it doesn't mean that we don't hurt here on this earth. You know, sadly, there was a time, and there still, I think, are some churches that will say this, that if you lose a loved one, as we've had many people recently lose loved ones, what they say is, well, they were a Christian. You don't need to be sad. There's no need to mourn, and that's absolutely not true. Um, we don't mourn for them. They're with Jesus. We rejoice for them, but still, we are hurting, and we're suffering. In the article, Shelley, and it's Dr. Rambo to you, said... There's this sense that because it's a part of the narrative of the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, yes, there may be extreme suffering, but we have the good news in the end. The effect of that, though, is that often we don't linger very long on suffering in Christian churches. So often it's glossed over, the pain. And uh, if you watch television evangelists, you certainly see this to be true. They often just talk about what I call the happy gospel. You know, the, the good side of it. Normally there's like a southern accent, you know. They're like, Jesus, he wants you to be prosperous. And he wants you to be blessed. He wants to pour down good things. You have a home, he wants you to have a big home. You have a car, he wants you to have a beautiful car. Because he loves you. He wants everything to be beautiful. Really? Because when I read my New Testament, Jesus died on a cross. And before that, they whipped him towards back. Oh, that doesn't sound like prosperity to me. The Apostle Paul, anyone ever read about the Apostle Paul? No prosperity there, just suffering. Well, if you're not going through hard times right now, just wait, you will. And I'm not wishing that on you, it's just hard times are part of life. In a little over a week's time, this is a couple of weeks ago, we had three members of our church family who lost their mothers. Linda Hannah, and then Hazel Witherspoon, and then Tom Dish, and then Yesterday, found out Mari Crum's mother had passed away in Hungary, where Mari can't even go and be there for the funeral. Um, tough times come for a church of our size. That's a lot of pain all at once. But that's the nature of living in this world. Some of you, you're in the furnace right now. Some of you have recently passed through it. But sooner or later, we all go through difficult times. And it begs some questions. What have I done to deserve this treatment? Why does God allow this to happen? One of the questions that Christians group wrestled with yesterday, as Melissa shared, uh, I didn't know about that, but uh, pretty neat how that dovetails. 
But here's the thing, we wonder this, did God make a cosmic blooper? Is this a mistake? Now the topic we're tackling this morning is uh, a commonly asked question about God. It's been referred to as the Achilles heel of Christianity. George Barna, a public opinion pollster, conducted a national survey. He asked adults, if you could ask God one question, what could it be? The number one response was, why is there pain and suffering in the world? This isn't just an intellectual issue to be debated in sterile academic circles. It's an intensely personal matter that can leave us with spiritual vertigo. Well, the Bible helps us see that there are at least four reasons why bad things happen. The first is individual sin. In order to understand this, we have to go back to the book of Genesis. It says God created Adam and Eve in his image. Last week we looked at a passage that Jesus was the image of God. We talked about the fact that image of God doesn't mean that God looked like a 30-something Jewish guy. It means that who Jesus is reflected God. And the same way the fact that they were created in God's image means that they were moral beings with rationality. So God did not create evil, rather he created the possibility of evil when he created human beings. He gave Adam and Eve moral parameters that they were to live within, but they chose to defy him and to disobey him. Ever since that day, every one of us has been born with that same rebellious bent for sin. We can make decisions to build others up and to do good, or we can make decisions to tear others down and do what is wrong. Our actions have a direct impact on others. Luke chapter 13, we read this. Now there were some present at that time who told Jesus about the Galilean whose blood Pilate had mixed with their sacrifices. And Jesus answered, Do you think that these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered this way? I tell you, no. But unless you repent, you too will all perish. Or those 18 who died when the tower in Siloam fell on them. Do you think that they were more guilty than all the others living in Jerusalem? I tell you, no. But unless you repent, you too will all perish. This group of people go and they ask Jesus, like, why did this happen? Why did Pilate murder these men and women as they are literally worshiping God in the temple? Why do humans do evil and why does God allow it? You may wonder that. Why doesn't God step in and prevent it? Prevent people from doing bad things? Well, that would make us robots. Our freedom gives us the ability to hurt others. Rabbi Harold Kushner wrote a best-selling book called Why Bad Things Happen to Good People. The problem with that title is what the Bible teaches is there are no good people. We are all rebels against God. His image has been tarnished. We're not imperfect people who need to grow. We are rebels who need to surrender our arms. When sinful people make decisions, God allows those to play out. And sometimes those consequences result in bad things happening to you and to other people. And then sometimes we suffer from the consequences of our own sin. You know, if you go over and rob the quick check right over here and the police arrest you and then after you're like, I don't know why God is doing this to me. I'm going to prison. Why would God, God, that's his fault. So sometimes what happens is the result of our own sin and the consequences of it. But I do know people who every single time something bad happens, they think like, what did I do? Why is God punishing me? And it's not always punishment. In Luke 13, verse 2, Jesus addressed this when he said, Do you think these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered this way? I tell you no. So individual sin leads to suffering. Sometimes it's our own choices. It's sometimes we're getting the consequences of what we've done. But also the sin nature is here, and it causes us to hurt others and people to hurt us. Secondly, there's collective sin. We live in a disease and death-filled environment. Before Adam and Eve rebelled against God, there were no earthquakes, floods, hurricanes, natural disasters, or diseases. Yesterday, when I read about Haiti and what was happening there, about this devastating earthquake that they said over 300 people killed, they think there could be many more, at least a couple thousand people injured. Again, there could be many more. And this is a nation whose president was just assassinated. A tropical storm is going to hit them tomorrow. The suffering, but... This is all because of sin. 
the earthquake, the, the tropical storm, and then the sin of individuals that murdered their president. All this came rolling into the scene because of Adam and Eve. They told God to take a hike by their actions, and God said, okay. The earth was cursed. Genetic breakdown and disease came in. COVID-19 is a direct result of sin when it came into the world. Pain and death became part of the human experience. Listen to how God describes it in Genesis chapter 3, verse 17. He said, Cursed is the ground because of you. Through painful toil you will eat of it all the days of your life. It will produce thorns and thistles for you. So in D Genesis we see that disobedience results in shame, alienation from God and others, and also in the disruption of nature. The third thing is Satan's work. Many of the bad things that happen in this life are because of his destructive designs. Satan is ultimately behind all the evil things that happen in the world. The Taliban overtaking things in Afghanistan. Satan at work. He works behind the scenes to inflame our passions, to prompt us to make bad choices. He's out to spoil God's world in any way he possibly can. Jesus called him a murderer. But then here's the hardest one for us to deal with, and that's God's decision. God's in control. He allows suffering. If he's a good God, how can he allow bad things to happen? That goes right to the heart of the question. If God is good, why does he allow evil? I'll be the first to admit that I don't fully understand this, but I know that God is good, and I also know that bad things do happen, and it's all part of his plan. God puts it this way in Isaiah chapter 55. He says, As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. In other words, we're never going to understand everything that's happening in this world. In this earth, we will not comprehend what God is doing. He takes evil, bad things, things that are meant for wrong. Like Joseph said, you meant this for evil. God didn't. He meant it for his glory. So we need to understand that he is at work in ways we sometimes can't see. He's a good God, and so suffering must have some benefits. And the Bible speaks of at least four good things that come out of the bad things in this world. The first is that suffering strengthens us. If you think about it, we can only learn qualities like endurance and patience if we go through some difficulties. Yesterday, a pastor friend of mine who constantly barrages me with cartoons and far side things sent me this. It fits so perfectly. Dear Lord, bless me with patience. Not opportunities to be patient. I've had plenty of those, and they don't seem to be working. The actual patience. Isn't that the truth? Like, like God, I don't want you to. I want you to give me. Like, literally, just hand it to me. I don't want you to teach me patience. You know, because teaching, that's hard. I don't want you to teach me how to endure. That, that's painful. Just, just give me endurance. Hand me patience. Well, we need to understand that suffering strengthens us. That's one of the things, God, how he uses it in our lives. James chapter 1, verse 2 says this, Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. Well, that great preacher, Charles Spurgeon, said, I'm certain that I never did grow in grace one half as much as I have upon the bed of pain. I know in my own life, it's been those dark times, difficult times. That's when I have most sensed the Lord's presence. That's when he's helped me to grow the most. I always say, like, Lord, just let me grow during the good times. You know, I don't want you to need to use suffering to wake me up and to help me to grow in you. So suffering does strengthen us. It also equips us. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, we read this. The God of all comfort comforts us in all our troubles so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves have received from God. So another thing that suffering does is it enables us to then minister to those who are hurting. Deb and I experienced a miscarriage before uh, Joel was born. We didn't know, would we be able to have children? And if you haven't experienced a miscarriage, like it just sounds like, yeah, that's kind of sad, but it's like devastating, so much more than I ever imagined it would be. And for Deb, even more so, it was her body affected and 
and, and so it was really hard. But the neat thing was the way Christians came around us. Our church in Maryland, we were at the time, we had no idea how many women had had miscarriages. The leader of her care group, a women's group, was, had had one, and boy, Karen was there for Deb in just an amazing way. She comforted Deb because of what she had experienced. And in the same way now, Deb and I can comfort those who experience it in a way we would not have been able to do. Deb has lost both of her parents. Mine are both still alive. So when it comes to someone losing her parent, like four people in our church have done this month, she's more able to effectively minister to them. So God equips us through the suffering in our lives to minister to others in a way that we couldn't do without it. The third thing is that suffering trains us. God may use the bad things you're experiencing to teach you something you couldn't learn any other way. We disobey him. When we walk away, he uses discipline to train us and teach us in righteousness. Hebrews 12 says, They, our parents, disciplined us for a little while as they thought best. But God disciplines us for our own good in order that we may share in his holiness. No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who've been trained by it. So when God wants to teach us something, he often brings trouble into our lives, especially when we've been wandering from him, when we've been disobeying him. God will have to discipline us, not out of desire to cause us pain, but out of a a desire to draw us closer to himself, to make us realize we need him. Well, Rick Warren, in his book, The Purpose Driven Life, says that God cares more about our character than our comfort. And so sometimes suffering comes because God wants to work on us, and the only way we'll learn is through trials and pain. Well, there's one other benefit to suffering, and that's that suffering wakes us. I have often quoted C.S. Lewis's words. God whispers to us in our pleasures. He speaks in our conscience, but shouts in our pains. It's his megaphone to rouse a deaf world. God uses our suffering, our pain, to get our attention, to make us run to him instead of doing the same old things we've been doing. Professor Bruce Waltke describes a Christian's response to pain this way. He says, we once rescued a bird from the claws of our cat. He says, though its wing was broken, this frightened bird tried to struggle out of my gentle, caring hands. Contrast that, he says, with my daughter. Her throat was hurting. They took her to the doctor. She had strep throat. And the doctor said, I'm going to have to give her a shot. And he said, my daughter cried, no, daddy, no, daddy, no, daddy. But while she was saying those things, she had her arms wrapped around him and she was holding on to him. And Waltke says, as Christians, our response should be more like his daughter than like the bird. One understands that the father is there and cares. The other didn't comprehend. As believers, we need to understand that God does care about us, that he wants to be there for us. Earlier in Luke 13, where Jesus talked about those who had been wiped out while worshiping and those who are killed by a building's fall. Jesus gives his answer to the question, why do bad things happen? His reply is very strong. Twice in the five verses we read, he says this in verses 3 and 5, but unless you repent, you too will all perish. Verse 5, but unless you repent, you too will all perish. Here we have the heart of Jesus. He longs for us to be restored to the Father for us to turn away from those things that are destroying us, the sin in our lives, those things that distract us from the Father, and that we would repent and turn back to him fully. Well, we think somehow we deserve good things. We feel like God owes us. Then when wrong things happen, we're angry because that shouldn't happen to me, God. Well, instead of wondering why bad things happen, Jesus reminded us that we are fallen individuals in a fallen world. We should be amazed and thankful. Again, Jesus says, do you think that those Galileans were worse than the others? Do you think the ones killed by that building falling deserved it more than others? No, we all deserve that. But God gives us grace, and that's why Jesus calls us to repentance. You know, one of the most vivid pictures of suffering in all of literature is found in the Bible. The story is a case study of human suffering. It chronicles the life of a truly good man, a righteous man who underwent extreme misery. He lost everything. 
his children all killed, his possessions gone, his health, his friends. His name is Job. The book that bears his name is a classic book on suffering. Job's trust in God wavered. He mourned. He cried out. He protested. He questioned. He even cursed the very day that he had been born. Job begged God to answer his questions. He desperately wanted to know why all these bad things were happening to him. Well, God answered him, but not in the way he expected. You see, God's answer to Job was unsettling. Instead of giving him a direct response, God gives the longest speech that is recorded in all of Scripture. Job chapter 38 to 41, God's like, are you done now? Okay, I've heard you're complaining, how, you know, you didn't deserve any of this, how good you are. Let me talk now. And so God talks, and his response is different than what you'd expect. He says, where were you when I established the heavens and the earth? Can you place the stars in the sky? Will the one who contends with the Almighty correct him? In other words, he's saying, I'm God. And you really think that you see the bigger picture that that you know better than I do? Where were you when I was creating this world? And so after getting a really tough theological lesson from God, Job broke down and said this in Job chapter 42. Surely I spoke of things I did not understand, things too wonderful for me to know. My ears had heard of you, but now my eyes have seen you. Therefore I despise myself and I repent in dust and ashes. So he's now confronted with the answer, which is that God is God. And that none of us deserve good things. He gives them to us anyway. His response is repentance. It's what Jesus was calling for. Repentance, that we would turn back to God. Repentance is turning away from sin. That's what we tend to think of. But it also means turning to God. And that's what we need to do in the midst of suffering that we return to the Lord, under, saying, God, I don't understand, but you are God. Really, it's like the Lord said to Job, I am your answer. Learn who I am. When you know me, you'll know how to handle anything. Job wasn't asked to trust a plan. He was asked to trust a person, a personal God who's in control and knows what's best for us. This has been called the first rule of the Christian life. He is God and we are not. And until we learn that and understand it, we are going to be miserable because things are never going to seem fair and we're never going to understand until heaven, we're not going to get. Why did these bad things happen? Why did all these mothers who were loved by their children pass away? Why is Jeff Crum, who's mourning for his mother-in-law, have a mother who just last Sunday, it was her birthday, they were going to be celebrating. They had people coming for a party, and instead he gets, a call, he gets to uh, her house, and a neighbor thankfully let them know the ambulance had just taken her away. She's still in the hospital. Thankfully it wasn't a stroke, but it's going to be a long time. She's going to be recovering. Why do these things happen? We can't understand them all. Blaming God got Job nowhere. So what was he going to do now? Was he going to shake his fist at God? Lord, I'm going to teach you by turning my back on you. Boy, when we do that, we really get him, don't we? Like God's up in heaven going like, oh no, what am I going to do now without Mark? No, we're hurting ourselves. That's the ones who's getting hurt. So the question is, are we going to get better or are we going to be bitter? Job's response was his responsibility. Our response is our responsibility. We can't change our circumstances. We can change, though, how we respond to them. So don't give up in the midst of pain. Don't become passive and just like, oh, I just can't take it. Don't become angry. Here's the thing. God is no stranger to pain. Our God is a suffering God. Jesus Christ came to this world, not to the acclaim that was due to him, there weren't parades in his honor, although there was one on Palm Sunday when they really didn't get it. A few days later, they're crow- shouting, crucify him. Jesus did not, was not born in a, in a palace, surrounded by servants, loved and magnified by all. No, instead he came to preach a tough message and 
He died a horrible death on the cross. God understands pain. He may not shield us from all of life's storms, but he does shelter us. Psalm 18 says this, I love you, Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock, my fortress, and my deliverer. My God is my rock in whom I take refuge. My shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. So here the psalmist is saying, God is his strength. And twice he says, God, you're my rock. You're my place of refuge. In our time, we don't have places of refuge. We don't have fortresses. We don't have mountaintops we go hide on while the enemy is coming to attack. But in that time, a rock was a place of safety. And that is what God is to us. The Lord is our rock. So when you're stuck between a rock and a hard place, turn to the rock. Embrace his love and his grace. You have a choice. You can accept the bad things that come your way and allow them to strengthen you, allow them to equip you, allow them to train you and allow them to wake you. Or you can become a bitter, hardened person. And some of you have known people like that. What I've seen from Christians is that when real suffering and pain and hardship comes, one of two things happen. Some of them just become bitter. And they say, God, how could you do this to me? And some of them walk away. They stop spending time with God. They're just like, Lord, if you're going to do this to me, I'm turning my back on you. But then there are others who I see draw close to him. And experience his presence. In my life, again, the, the times I've grown the most is in the midst of suffering when he has shown himself to be real. Think of Deb's brother, who I've shared before, when his wife died of cancer at the age of 50. Instead of walking away from God, this guy, Chip, who, who he knew Jesus. He'd been a Christian all of his life, maybe since his teens. But this was a guy who was not serious about his faith. He was serious about his business, very successful, very wealthy. He was about himself, and man, he just changed. And suddenly his heart, you just saw this soft heart for God and a real care and concern for others. You have a choice when you face trials. Are you going to become bitter, or will you let God make you better? When we, we can either hurt with God, or we can hurt without God. If you're hurting today, you may feel like you're at the end of your rope. I pray that you'll hang on to the Lord. If you turn away from him, things will only get worse. Put your trust in him. In a sermon titled, Pain is the Name of the Game, Pastor John Guest said this, In American football, there's one thing that you have to admire these guys for. They all play hurt. That is, they go out there and they play while they're hurting. They don't go to their coach and say, Hey, coach, I got this terrible bruise on my thigh. I'm going to take a couple weeks off. He says, but how many Christians with a little bruise to their ego, a little forgetfulness on someone else's part, go off and whine and lock themselves in their bedroom and throw a depressive fit? It's very sad, he says. We as followers of Jesus Christ in pain keep on with the game because in this life, pain is the name of the game. We have been promised nothing else. I remember sitting in the emergency room with Deb's mom. She was battling an ovarian cancer and was losing the battle. And I remember her turning to me and saying this, words of the Apostle Paul. She said, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. She fought the terrible disease, but she remembered that her salvation was offered and was secured in Christ, that eternity was her home in heaven. Her faith gave her strength in the midst of the suffering that came through cancer. I wonder about you. Are you ready to do whatever it takes to trust God and his goodness? It's easy when things are going well to say, oh yeah, sure, I, I definitely would. But when trials come, what will you do? Will you run away from God? Or will you run to the one who made you, and who loves you more than you could possibly imagine? Let's pray. Father, I thank you for being a God who understands pain. Jesus, I think of that scourging that you took as the Roman soldiers shredded your back with pain I've never experienced and will likely never experience. And then on that cross, which was a horrible way to torture people to death, 
And yet you did that for us. You took that pain and suffering for us. Lord, we are grateful that you do care about us. And God, I admit this morning, we don't always understand why is there suffering? Why is there pain? It doesn't make sense to us. Lord, help us to trust that you are God and you see the bigger picture that we cannot see. That you understand us and you know what's best for us. Help us to trust you, even as that little girl wrapped her arms around her daddy and said, no, daddy, but trusted him anyway. Help us, Lord, in the midst of pain to run to you. I do pray for those here this morning who are hurting now. I pray for those in our church who have lost their mothers, these four dear people who are still in pain, asking you, Lord, to be close to them. But I know there's others here who are suffering, whether it's physically or emotionally, whether it's grief or it's a broken relationship, whether it's a broken dream, Lord, whatever it is, I pray that you'll be close to them. Father, help them to run to you, to let you be the rock in their life, that you would be the one they trust in, that you would be the place they find strength. And then for those of us, Lord, today we're doing well. Life is going along well. Father, help us to be ready when suffering does come. Help us to plant our feet firmly in you, that when trials come, we would never doubt you. When trials come, Lord, that we could just simply return to the Father that we've been spending our time with anyway, and that we would experience that comfort that only you can give. Thank you, Jesus, for being that rock, our refuge. Thank you, God, for sending your Son, that we can have eternal life, and that we know eventually this pain will end as we are with you in heaven. And Jesus, we pray all this in your precious and holy name. Amen.